may have in that regard. <coughs> this series, this month and, and uh, the month of November, is on the church empowered. And today, um, the, the title of the message is the plan and the purpose of the church. And just give me a little, just a little vision here, an overview. This entire letter is about the church. The church global, the church local. It's about us. It's directed right to you, right to me. It's a very doctrinal letter, uh, very thematic, very step-by-step process of thought that uh, Paul has, and he's laying it out for us. And for the last 2,000 years, the church, global and local, have been looking at this text and saying, what does it speak to us? And they're applying it. In chapter 1, we saw God's project. By His own mind, He predestined and uh, began to choose and adopt and elect and bless who He wanted to call His people. Chapter 2, we see the process, that it's by His grace that we're saved through faith in Jesus Christ. And He also says, by doing so, He makes us a dwelling place, a holy temple for Him to dwell in. That's you. That's His process, that by His grace you're saved, that you might be the dwelling place of God. Today, we're looking at the plan and the purpose of the church. What is this about? Why is He doing this? For what purpose? And from this point forward, it's all about how we're going to be functioning in this world. Today, we'll look at how His plan is that through the church, the wisdom of God is revealed to the nations, make manifest His wisdom to all areas, the heavens, the governments within the church, and the family. Chapter 4 deals explicitly explicitly with how the Lord and the wisdom is displayed in this process and this plan is done within the body of the believers. <clears throat> Chapter 5 is all about being in the home and in the workplace, how this lives out as a dwelling place of God everywhere you go. Chapter 6, again, you're going to be going out into the world, how you function there and dealing with the things of the world and the things in the heavens being armored for such a thing. So we're looking at His plan, His purpose for the church and the world. And today we're dealing with governments and powers in the heavens. I have a lot of conversations with a lot of people <clears throat> and individuals talk to me and I'm grateful that they think I'm safe enough to have a conversation in regard to politics and policies and all this thing. A lot of people are uh, don't even want to talk about that, and usually because the animosity that comes out. But I've heard many people, Christian people, say, I'm not going to vote. Some would say, you know what, there's just not a candidate <clears> or <throat> an option that rises to the level of spiritual capacity that I could ever vote for. I just, I don't feel comfortable, so I'm not going there. Some say, I'm going to go third party. For that very reason, I'm going to make... My stand here, and I want this guy, it's my vote, I'm going to do that. And good, all right, I hear that. Some people say, Jesus wouldn't have voted, I'm not voting. Okay. Well, we'll look at those, those points today. Did you know that 41% of church, synagogue-going people don't, uh, vote? 59% don't. Bible-believing Christian people, 59% don't vote for those reasons that I just mentioned. They say, well, I don't want to get political, Dave, and I'm not going to be political, but I am going to say some things about who we are as a church as this text is telling us how we're to function as the church in the world. So we're going to be biblical, but I'm not going to be endorsing anybody, but I am going to say we need to be voting biblically. We need to be positioned in this world biblically. Why? Because he said he's making a dwelling place, a holy temple. That's you. Now, if you recall, when Jesus went into the temple and they were having money changing going on and all kinds of chaos and commotion and commerce within the temple, 
It was the one time in Scripture, and we see it in all four Gospels, that Jesus behaved in a manner that seemed to be unaccustomed. He began to tip over tables. He made a whip, charging them out. Why would He do this? Because the temple, He said, my, my temple is to be a house of prayer, but you've made it into a den of thieves. It wasn't that they were doing commerce. It wasn't that they were changing out Greek things for the temple coin. It wasn't that they were purchasing all of the sacrificial things because they had traveled in and they couldn't drive their sheep and bring their doves and all that. So they had these available, all great things, all established things. But all of these things were supposed to be surrounding the temple, not in the courts of the temple. They were peripheral, and yet they had become central. And it was supposed to be a holy place. You say, well, holy, doesn't that mean perfect? No, it does not mean perfect. In the Old Testament, we saw that forks and plates and utensils and animals were all called holy. Why? Because they had been dedicated for the purpose of God wholly set apart for what God wanted them to be for Him. Now, think about that in light of Jesus being at the center of our lives because we're the temple. A lot of times we have a whole lot of things that should be peripheral in our life, (laughs) important, okay, but they have come into the center point so that our temple is not full of what it needs to be full of, so it can't bring out what it's supposed to bring out. If you ever have a washing machine and you put a load of uh, clothes in there, and after a while it seems to get wet and go to one side of the washing machine, it gets out of balance and it makes the drum get off and bounces against the washing machine wall, which bounces against the dryer wall, which <laughs> bounces against the wall. And it sounds like the place is going crazy. So what do you do? You go in there, you lift up the lid of the washing machine, and you begin to redistribute things around the center. Because you don't want to be out of balance. And what Paul is going to be dealing with you and I today as the dwelling place, the holy temple of God, that we have been made for a particular purpose And his plan is that that's got to be taken place, and it can only happen if we're a holy temple with him at the center. That might mean he tips over some tables in your mind, tips over some tables in your worldviews. It makes you become more center to him and to his word. We stand on the word of God. Jesus believed in the Scripture. He fulfilled the Scripture. He came to bring this to us, this gospel message. It's got to be central in the holy temple of the church. Now, Paul begins to deal with this in light of this mystery, the mystery of God. And really, we talked about what this mystery was last week, that he was making one body, the church, out of Jews and Gentiles, all of humanity, who was going to call to himself and by his blood on the cross he would make one body with him as the head of the church. And that's the mystery. Look at verses 1 through 6 with me. For this reason I, Paul, a prisoner of Christ Jesus on behalf of you Gentiles, assuming that you have heard of the stewardship of God's grace that was given to me for you, how the mystery was made known to me by revelation, as I have written briefly. When you read this, you can perceive my insight into the mystery of Christ which was not made known to the sons of men in other generations, as it has now been revealed to His holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit. This mystery is that the Gentiles are fellow heirs, members of the same body, and partakers of the promise in Christ through the gospel. We could go through the whole thing. That last verse is it. The mystery is this. What is the mystery of God? The Gentiles are fellow heirs, members of the same body, partakers of the promise. Good, great. That means He's making one body, and you're invited, church. 
Gentiles, you're invited to be part of this. See, we can break this down into several things. He says the mystery is given. He's a stewardship of this grace in verse 2. He's a stewardship. Uh, there's administration of this grace in some of your translations of this mystery. He says the mystery has been revealed to us. It wasn't made known before, but it's made known by revelation, by His Spirit. He says that you can actually perceive this. It's been given. It's revealed. You can understand this. You can, you can perceive what He's going to do. So we say mystery. Don't get caught up in, well, then I can't know. You can know because it's revealed. It's been given. It's revealed. And it's perceptible. Then He defines it. You're in. You're in. In Christ, through His sacrifice, you're saved by His grace, and you're in. You are part of the temple, the holy temple, the dwelling place of God. Amen, church. That's amazing, right? If when you come to Christ, you're it. (laughs) You're His plan. You are the plan to be His heirs, members of His body, in this world. That's the plan. There's no other plan. There's no secondary plan. It's just that you might come to an understanding in Christ that you've been adopted. There's a way. There's a path. He's made it. That's the beauty of it. So, how does he go forward? He reveals this mystery of God, and then he goes on in verses 7 through 13, the plan and the purpose of this mystery. What's the mystery? You're in. So what? From this point forward in this letter, it's so what? All of that, the project, the process, the purpose, the plan, everything. Now we're here. So what? I'm the dwelling place of God. I'm called to be wholly devoted to Him as a holy temple. He at the center of my heart and my life and my worldview. So what does that mean? He goes on. Let's take a look at verses 7 through 13, where Paul does talk about the plan and the purpose of the mystery. He says, of this gospel, I was made a minister according to the gift of God's grace, which was given me by the working of His power. To me, though I'm the very least of all the saints, this grace was given to preach to the Gentiles. Preach what? The unsearchable riches of Christ. And to bring to light, look at those two words, for everyone, what is the plan of the mystery hidden for the ages in God? So, let me just tell you that. We, we want to speak to the Gentiles that you're in, let them know, but we're going to tell everybody what the plan is. This is for everyone. We're going to bring a light for everyone what the plan of this mystery of the gospel making us one is. Hidden for ages in God who created all things so that, listen, through the church, the manifold wisdom of God might now be made known to the rulers and authorities in heavenly places. This was according to the eternal purpose that He has realized in Christ Jesus our Lord, in whom we have boldness and access with confidence through our faith in Him. So, I ask you to not lose heart over what I'm suffering for you, which is your glory. They're sad, this church in Ephesus. Paul's in jail. He's in Rome. He's in chains. Don't be sad, because what I'm going through here is I am actually doing this for the glory of the church, for the glory of the Lord. I'm going through my suffering because this plan has got to be made known. This mystery of who we are, what we're called to be, has to be a light shining to everyone. So what's the plan? First, to preach to the Gentiles. The unsearchable riches of Christ. Tell everybody, you can can come to God. 
You can have access to God. You can be in right relationship with God. There's a way, even though you've walked in sin, you're living a broken life, you're, you're so far out of where Christ should be in your life as center, He's made a way for you by His grace. The unsearchable riches, and you go back to chapter 1 to take a look at what all those riches and blessings are. Second part of the plan is to bring to light for everyone what's the plan of the mystery. You see that? We're going to tell the gent, we're going to tell everybody who's not a Jew about how to come to Jesus. And we're going to tell everybody what the plan of that mystery is. We're going to shed a light on it. We're going to be relevant in a dark place. We're shining a light into the world. Everyone. That's the plan of the church. This is what it's all about. We teach the gospel share the gospel so that man might be come to Christ, and we bring a light of the wisdom of God to the world. So that's the purpose, the plan, and now the purpose in verses 10 through 13, and this is where we're going to go deep into our deep waters as we deal with who the church is in the world in light of government's authorities and everyone. It says, through the church… The wisdom of God made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly places, according to the eternal purpose that He realized in Christ Jesus our Lord. Okay, wisdom of God made, the manifold wisdom of God made manifest to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly places. Well, who are those? Who or what is that in heavenly places? Does Paul refer to this anywhere in the Scripture? Do the Scriptures reveal anything in regard to this dynamic that he's bringing to light? We see the word principalities and powers six times in the Bible. Many times they're referring to the demonic forces that are working in the world. And they work in the world through the thrones and the rulers of the earth. They work across the societal systems that entice humanity away from God. Remember in Daniel chapter 10, he's praying, give me help, send help. And the angel of God comes and he speaks and says, hey, I had to deal with the principality over Persia. There are angelic forces, fallen ones, demonic if you would, that rule over principalities, which is a geographic or governmental system. It just is. We see that Gabriel is a messenger of God, and over Israel, Michael the archangel has a role probably global in my estimation, but there are principalities over Persia. There's a principality over America. I would call it the United States of Molech. Do your research on Molech, and you'll see a clear picture of what I'm talking about. So there are angelic forces, fallen and not fallen, that are vying for what's going to happen in the established thrones and dominions on earth, globally, nationally, regionally, locally. Colossians 1.16 says this, for by Him all things were created in heaven and on earth visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through Him and for Him. So it's not just there, which we fast and pray and seek God for and stand against the enemy in the name of Jesus, but it's also breaking through that because we're having an impact and we're to shine our light everywhere to everyone that this Manifold wisdom of God is made manifest. That manifold wisdom of God is, is made manifest to the world, to the authorities in the heavens, and the dominions and the thrones on earth. It's not the first time, because he's dealing with a very global picture here, and now he's drawing it in closer as to what God's plan and purpose is, and he will bookend this. We're starting with the authorities, both heavenly and earthly, and we're going to end in chapter 6 on the same thing. 
Because we have to be a light to everyone in this world. How? Well, we look at this, this, this authority. God establishes authorities. We see in the Scripture that no one's in authority unless God places him. No king, no this. Uh, okay, God, so you've placed some people or allowed some people to be in place. Hopefully they're good guys or gals, and hopefully they're, they're not bad guys or gals. But you've allowed it. Sometimes he allows it because his people are completely living in sin. So, all right, you're going to get an unjust, really corrupt, very punishing ruler that's going to make your life miserable, and then you'll come to me rather than look at all the peripheral. You become holy people again rather than going off there and doing sinful things here, there, and everywhere and thinking that's okay because Christ isn't at the center. Your pleasures are at the center. So he allows that. God established the family first as an authority. He said, God blessed them, and God said to them, be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth. Yet listen, the family can be corrupted. Just because God established it does not mean it can't be destroyed. Yes, He, dis- he established marriage. Yes, He established parents and kids. But it can be corrupted by a husband, by a wife, by a kid. It can be corrupted if the family together is not going forward in a holy temple type of way. And I can say that it's not a ruling over the household, but a serving of the household that the father plays the role as a covering. If the husband is corrupt, the household will be corrupt. We're affected by that corruptedness. A righteous woman can stand in the gap for her family even though there's an unrighteous husband. A righteous husband can stand in the gap for his family in, though he has an unrighteous wife. Paul speaks about that. But the family, though established by God, could be corrupted. And we're called to bring the light. We got to declare the mystery of God that He's calling the members of the family to become part of the one person, part of His body, part of His church. Come to oneness before Him. We got to bring it to light and we have to proclaim it. God established the church, the family, and He established the church. 1 Peter 2 5 says, You yourselves, like living stones, are being built up as a spiritual house. This entire letter we're looking at. Is God establishing the church? But guess what? If you haven't paid attention, churches can get corrupt. Pastors can be corrupt. Members can be corrupt. Elders can be corrupt. Leaders can be corrupt. They can be rude. They can be cruel. They can be judgmental. They can be sinful. They could allow sin to magnify and be proclaimed and acclaimed and affirmed and celebrated within their midst. Jesus speaks to this in the seven churches in Revelation. I got this against you. Paul's writing letters to these churches saying, what do you think you're doing allowing this sin to continue in your church? Get them out of here. Give them over to the devil so they might repent and come back. You see, God established the church, but it could be corrupted So we as the church, Christ and His Word being central in our hearts, and He has to turn some tables in our own mind and saying, that sacred cow's got to go, that behavior's got to go. In the church, this has got to be established that Christ alone is the authority and we're going to be obedient to Him. We bring it to light and we proclaim it. He established families, He established the church, He also established governments been a lot of type of governments over the course of time. Kings, rulers, authoritarian, full democracies, socialism, communism, empirical, you name it. All kinds of governments established. Sometimes the leaders established by birth. You're the son of the king, you're the king. Sometimes not. Sometimes by overthrow. 
sometimes by assassination, and another family takes over, sometimes by a coup, sometimes by election. And these are the different governments. But God established them. Romans 13, 1 says, let every person be subject to the governing authorities, for there's no authority except from God. And those that exist have been instituted by God. You mean God instituted bad authorities? Yeah. For a myriad of manifold wisdom. He's above all things. His wisdom says, I think this situation here will draw my people closer to me, so it's going to go hard on them that they might turn to me. Oh, they're blessing me, exalting me. I'm going to put someone in that's going to exalt and please the nation. And everybody's going to get blessed because they're obedient. You're not obedient? Hey, here's a hammer. You are obedient? Here's a flower. He calls the ruler of Assyria and Babylon the sword, his sword. He established government. So that means he must have established our government. Ours is a unique government. The whole word out there, we're spreading democracy. That's a mistake because we're not a, a democracy. Our government is not a democracy. It's a constitutional republic. Say that with me, constitutional republic. God allowed for this government style to be established, a constitutional republic. And in this type of system, the people of the people, for the people, by the people, select representatives to go into a collective that will do the will of the people for the collective. They represent the vote and the choice of people. In our government, the top authority is not the president, it's not the Supreme Court, it's the people. Get that in your mind. I know you're not going to hear that. We've come to a day and age where we're the, we're the pawns and they're in control. They're the elite in control regardless of party or position. They're in control. Do what we say. We've got your best in mind. Folks, God established this government and you're the top of the tier. Straight up. Your selection sends someone to represent your selection to the collective. And that's how our government works. From the school board to the presidency, you choose. People elect. What happens if the people of God stand off by the wayside and says, I'm not in? Well, then you've abdicated your authority. Your void of what your voice is supposed to say is now absent so that another voice could fill it. Proverbs 29, 2 says, when the righteous increase, the people rejoice. But when the wicked rule, the people groan. 59% of Christians don't vote. Now think about our area, Seattle, Metro, Edmonds. I do a lot of helping with church planners. And they come in, they do the demographics and stuff, and they call the Seattle area a spiritual wasteland. It's more of a hard rock mission field than going anywhere on the face of the planet, including the 1040 window going behind the doors in Islamic countries. Seattle is tough soil. Only 4% of any of them even go to a religious establishment. 94% of the people you meet don't attend church, synagogue. That 4% includes wicked, satanic, any spiritual organization. 96% are not going. How do you think if they have nothing to do with the people of God, they never attend with the people of God, they don't think the way of God, how do you think they're going to vote? 
So we have to share the gospel truth with people. And we share the manifold wisdom of God to the people. Manifold. That word means varied. It means abundant. All variety. All aspects of the wisdom of God is now being made known through the church to everyone. So how do we change the hearts and minds of people who will never darken the door of religious institution? When we know already, in our area specifically, they are hardline-minded on several moral issues. You will not win the battle of the vote with talking to people about abortion, not in this state. You're not going to win the hearts and the minds of the people to make any changes whatsoever on the conversation about LGBTQ. Not in this state. Now, as a church, we stand for truth and righteousness, and that's all good, but you're not going to change 96% to vote in a right way or even any kind of way that would be better for the country if you go on these spiritual values that they care nothing about because the Spirit of God's not in them. So when we talk to the people about the grace of God and all this and share this wisdom of God, If wicked people rule, everybody groans. So what are we groaning about? What are they groaning about? Those are the conversations I'm having in in light of this where it comes to housing, when it comes to food, it becomes economy, it comes to safety issues, justice issues, border issues. They've got an opinion on this, and we can collaborate on is it working, is it not working, is that the right way, are we safer now than we were 18 years ago, 10 years ago? And they're saying, no, 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 no. Okay, then what kind of change has to be made? They will be moved and swayed, potentially, on their secular mindset that is not related to their moral fiber. Good luck with that. We'll probably be blue until Jesus comes. It's okay. Because it's not about blue and red. It's about righteous or not righteous. It's not even about Christian or not Christian, because we don't have a Christian country. We have Christian people in a country. And so we're not going to make a Christian country. Not happening. This will never be a theocracy, nor should it. Jesus alone is the head of His government, and that's the truth of it. But there might be not so great a people who actually bring into our schools locally, our courts locally, our city through councils, through mayors, through governors, through the state, for these elections locally that we can say, something's got to change on these areas. And they're not godly people, they're not Christian people, but we know this has got to happen because it's broken. Now let me just say that Chronicles talks about God healing a land when the people of God humble themselves and pray and repent. So we start with repentance of our own hearts, the humility of our own hearts, and we pray for God to do a work He says, yes, I will do a work as people's hearts are changed, as you share my light, share my gospel, share the wisdom that I have, that this land might be healed. But he'll say, you know, I'll do that, but I've also given you a lane to help with this, and that is you get to vote. So how do we proclaim this and bring light and make it known? Well, we have to be a visual representation of the body in this world. It means the way you live your life matters. If you're a hypocrite, a cruel person, a gossip, slanderer, a liar, vicious, cheating, whatever, then your witness is nothing, man, except for negative. Behave yourself. You're supposed to be a holy temple. Behave yourself. We need to be a verbal representative of the body in this world. That means we proclaim the truth. How? In love. How? It says, let all of your speech be edifying, seasoned with salt. You've got to say it in a way that's digestible. You standing there and slapping someone up over the head about immorality and this type of thing, going nowhere, friend. It's going nowhere. 
You have to make this digestible that they would even sniff it and taste it to see if it's palatable for their, their system. And the gospel is. The truth is, when it's presented, I like sushi. There's a new place downtown, nice people, great people, really high pre- price with quarter-sized pieces. Not very well displayed. I don't like it. Nice people. You and I used to go to lunch all the time over here at Sushimoto. Love it. It's great. That guy's great. He's retired. Boo. They closed it down. Boo. New guy has opened it. Yay. And the pieces are large and it's displayed beautifully. And when I look at it, the eyes are like, oh, I'm ready to tuck in. I'm ready. Let's go. That's for you Brits out there. Tuck in. That's a proper speech. But I have to make it, proclaim it in a way that someone will not just close their ears and say, you racist, bigot, fundamentalist, all the terms. We're a light. It does shine a light, but we don't have to be a searchlight in their eyes. Hey! We also have to be a voting representative of His body in this world. Make manifest to the powers. Make known to the powers. So we've got to bring that light, that voice to the authorities, the governing systems. As they represent us, we have to be a voice to that representation. So let me just tell you what voting is not very quickly. Voting is not a valentine. Remember when you were a kid? You're walking through school in class, and after a while they said you have to buy a valentine for everybody or for nobody, and I thought that was just stupid because I liked the little girl over there, and I wanted to make my little valentine for her and sneak up over there and sneak it onto her desk and walk away. Will you be my valentine? And she'd turn her head and go, no. <laughs> it's okay. This is not about an attraction. If you remember back in the very first televised presidential debate between Nixon and JFK, it had never been done before. Nixon came on, and people had never seen him, and now he, and he's not as attractive as the guy across the way. And for one reason or another, he didn't think about the idea of it. There was no makeup for the cameras or anything, and he looked completely washed out. And over here is this <laughs> suave, fair, good-looking young man with makeup. He shines, and the people fell in love with John F. Kennedy. An entire nation. And in that moment, it was not politic. It was a valentine. This guy looks good. From that day forward, we've had a high school prom king and queen election ever since. This is not a valentine. God told Samuel not to select a leader by appearance. We don't select because of good vibes, age, gender, color of skin, be they brown or orange, both are colors, personalities are going to pass away. Policies last a long time. This is not a valentine. Voting is not sending a message, and what I mean by that is voting third party or not voting is sending a message, because a message only matters if it's received. A woman asks her husband what he'd wish for. He thinks for a moment. He says, well, if I had something that would make something 200 that was zero, he was thinking, oh, money, this would uh, be great. 200 that was zero, instantaneous, that'd be great. So she bought him a scale. It didn't quite get received what he was looking for. This idea that, and I have done this many, many times, I'm not going for lesser of two evils. I'm going for this third-party person because I see their statement. I'm all in for that guy, and they never win. Until something changes in our nation, I'm sorry, it's ruled by a two-party system. We vote, vote for party candidates, not national candidates. This is who the party puts forward, not who the nation puts forward. You watch debates in the primaries, the coverage they have, the media coverage, the total uh, ordination of the candidate they want and drop off some fantastic candidates in the primary because they always knew that was the person. In this last situation, lots have been going on there. But if you vote third party, the message isn't going to be received. You threw your vote. 
So in my heart, I have to. Fair, I got it. But until you get to a time when there's a Ross Perot, where there's a viable option that there's a third party that could win something, an independent that actually is actually on the stage debating with the others, which hasn't happened in a while. When was the last time you saw an independent or third party on the stage in a national election debate? It doesn't happen anymore. So if you want your message to get across, you can't be throwing it to the wind or not sending it. It's not going to get received. Voting for a selection is not a sacrament. We take communion and we do baptism. These are ordinances and sacraments. Who you chick, ch- pick is not a sacrament. We're looking for someone with impurities. Let me just tell you something. Jesus is not on the ballot. Get over it. So what does that mean? Very quickly, there are three types of leaders in the Scriptures. There's a Josiah, king becomes eight, lives righteous before God, blessed before God, tears down all the Baal worship, all the idols, all the poles, everything is down. He finds the Word of God that's been hidden in a back room, brings it out, reads it to the people, starts the Passovers, all the celebrations, brings out, blesses the priests, temples, everything gets reestablished, and the people are blessed beyond measure. Every mama wants her son to grow up to be Josiah. And wouldn't we all love to see a Josiah on the ballot? It'd be lovely. The second type of leader is an Ahab and a Jezebel who tear down, persecute all of God's people, shut down the temple, desecrate the temple, build up all kinds of temples to foreign gods, follow Baal, Molech's okay, we're sacrificing children now, immorality is throughout the nation, all kinds of perversion. It's all good and great. Trying to kill the people of God. Fine, that's not who you want in authority, is it? No. See, a righteous person promotes righteousness. An unrighteous person promotes unrighteousness. Jesus even says to a church in Revelation, He calls a lady in the church Jezebel. You don't want that. The Bible says that Ahab did more to provoke the Lord, the God of Israel, to anger than all the kings of Israel who were before him. So I'd love to see Josiah, and God help me, I'll never go for Ahab, but is there a third option? Jesus isn't on the ballot for your city council. Josiah may not be on the ballot for your city council. Do we have another option? Well, the Bible talks about a man named Jehu. He was the son of the king, and when his dad died, he came in, and he tore down all the things of Baal, every temple, every worship, hunted down all the prophets, all the priests, got rid of them, established the temple worship again. He did so much good that the people rejoiced, and they were blessed. But he, he had a grandfather who had built a golden calf in the north, and he didn't want to tear that down. So he allowed some false stuff going up there. He was not perfect, and he allowed some things. I said, what are you doing? you got to tear that down. I'm not going to tear that down. My dad did that. Okay. I long for a Josiah. Josiah is not present. I won't go for an Ahab. I'll never do that. Is there a Jehu in the mix? Imperfect, but closer to what God might desire for a nation. And you, as the church, His purpose for you and me as holy temples is, yes, to speak the gospel to all people that might come to know Jesus, but also to proclaim to the authorities the wisdom of God. And in our government, you're on top. So close this message, we must make manifold, bring to light and proclaim the mystery of God to the family, to the church, to the government. That's our purpose. Now, this Friday, if you haven't registered, you can register. You should register. Be too late after that. Ballots will come out on the 18th. We have out there, I think it says, vote biblically. An entire series on this. You can go back to our website and say that... uh, 
It's called uh, Citizens of Heaven, Social Issues, and the Sacred Mind. You go back and watch that on every point of view and every little thing we went through biblically. I pray that you do so. And I'll be praying for you as God would lead you in this privilege that we have in this country that He established, that you have a voice, and it should be a godly voice. Pray with me. Lord, You know what is needed, and You know whether we're on this path towards wellness or that path towards the destruction. You know who the people of God are. You know the church in America, and Lord, <laughs> much of the church is corrupt. So we know that whoever you have going into the authority of our local and county and state and national government will be established by you and be exactly what the people need, whether it be a blessing or a hammer. We submit to you. We long, Lord God, for your Spirit to speak in us as your church that we might bring to light in a beautiful way, in a lovely, edifying way, your wisdom. We ask, Lord God, you'd guide us, that we would be act, act, active people, verbal people, visual people, voting people, to make your way known. And Lord, we'll be moving on into the family and how it gets right close to home next week. But in this week, in this moment, we stand against the enemy and the principalities and the powers. Pray against it, Lord. Call us to a fast to come against it. Break through with angels to do battle in the heavenlies that the systems of this world might be broken and we might move once again towards the righteous where the people rejoice versus wickedness where we're all groaning. Have your way. Use us for your glory in this. In Jesus' name, amen. A church, very briefly, uh, outside in the foyer, there's a, there's a sign up for the 24 hour prayer vigil that we have going, not this weekend, but next weekend, the last weekend of October. All the partner ministries are signing up. We'll have a book, it's out there. You can take that. It has the prayer and praises for every partner we have in Rock of Hope. So take that, sign up for an hour. You don't have to come to the church. It's been an hour going through that book and just praying and asking God to, thanking God for His praise, what's been done in those ministries, asking God to bring about His will in those ministries through their prayer request as well. You've been bringing in shoe boxes. We're we'll continuing to do that through October. There's a, a display out in the foyer. Make sure you get a hold of that. Uh, today at 4 o'clock, I'm starting a class on the foundations for spiritual maturity. Uh, if you want to be a part of that class, let me know today. I've got some booklets ready. Several are coming, so I'm having that class at 4, and I uh, look forward to seeing those of you who have signed up. And for those who want to come, 4 o'clock today, we'll be meeting in Classroom A. Uh, thank you for your continued generosity and those of you who are giving online and those here who use the QR codes. We have people using Tithely for that, and those who still write checks and drop in the back. As the Lord's blessed you, be a cheerful giver as He speaks to you that you might be a blessing to the whole work of what's going on in a Rock of, a Rock of Hope Church. God bless you. You have something there, it looks like. It is. Well, you know, we found out that we have a pastor at this church, and we found out that we know what makes a pastor a pastor, and that's a pastor's wife. Yay! Without, without a pastor's wife, I'll tell you, it's just, it's just not the same. So June, if you want to come up, you don't have to come up here. You can stay back there. You want to come? <laughs> Can I come down and stand by her, or is this just a... Can, okay. Can, okay. Can, <laughs> I'll come on this side of Annie. Up, down. There we go. Hey. Come on. Oh. Come on. <laughs> you know, it's amazing what God can do if we're willing to be used by God. And these two have done something. How many do we have in here? Oh, we're crowded. We're just... Got, but they're still here. Because they're called of God. How many of your friends are, have gone and they say, oh, I want to go to a big place. I want to do this and that. 
thank you so much for doing what you're supposed to do, even though it's very difficult. How are we going to make it? You know whose fault that it? is? This is God's fault. <laughs> right? That's not a shaky fist. We, got, we, got we have to follow what God says. So we've got people that come in and bake you and make you and all sorts of stuff. But thank we you. want to thank you for all you've done. Thank you. Father, thank you for this couple, their family, everything that they've done over the years. They have no reason to be here whatsoever except for your call. Help us to help them in what they do. Thank you for your love for us. Thank you for the privilege of having them at our church and that they've made this their home. Thank you for your love. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you, Dan. Thank you, church. Hey, Jude, big kiss. Oh. <laughs> Pee away there, there. Huh? All right. That's good. Thank you so much. Thank you. All right. Uh, I, I, I'm always surprised by that. I don't know why I never think about that. I came in this morning, and they were praying for the pastor uh, here in the Anchor Church, and Dan and Esther were out there, and they said, uh, oh, um, it, it's a pastor appreciation day, and I go, it is? <laughs> I never remember, but you guys always bless us. You're so faithful. It's like in your mind, and it tells me, and I know it for a fact, not just today, but every day, that you have me, have our, our ministry, have June and I in your prayers, in your hearts, and we love you, and we, we definitely feel your love as well. Thank you, everybody, so much. Hey, well, it's 10 10, 10 12. And actually, it's 12 12. 12 12. It's 10 12, somewhere in the middle of the ocean. That's all right. I'm, thinking, I'm Hawaii time, Hawaii time. No, would you stand with me? We're going to break away. We're going to go out today. Remember that you are his ambassadors. We're going to shine light, we're going to proclaim. We're going to bring the light, and how we're going to, uh, we're going to be ambassadors, and so what?